Well, I, I keep doing this, but let me start with a few comments before I get into the main body of the sermon. Um, uh, first, a, a few weeks ago, I suggested that if you didn't have a good study Bible, that, that you should not only get one, but you should be reading it daily. Um, I hope that's not exactly, you know, brand new news to any of you. Um, I did have a couple of them to look at you, and I'll admit they looked like just big dictionaries. Um, well, I, I did, um, this last week, while I was at the Gospel Coalition, uh, bought my daughter uh, a, a nice leather-covered ESV study Bible uh, that actually looks pretty cool. And uh, so I thought, well, maybe you want to see one that doesn't look quite so ugly. Uh, and so I have it in the Fellowship Hall on the table back there. Uh, you want to see what it looks a little bit more like and what would be a little more typical kind of Bible you might buy and carry. Um, she, uh, she started reading it, really likes it. So it's good things to say. Now let me start this morning by thanking you for, for allowing me to lead you into some deep waters in, in our Reformed faith over the past 12 sermons. I know that for the last three months, these have not been the, you know, five ways to make you happy today kind of sermons that are all too common in many churches. And I've, I've heard a few more people than normal say, well, you've given me a lot to think about after the sermon, um, which is both a sign of success for me, but also a sign that I'm working you hard. Um, I do think in a world of what, what many people call light Christianity, Having an opportunity to look at our biblical faith at its most foundational levels, uh, levels and our own Christian heritage is critical uh, for nurturing the gift of grace that God has given us. And third, I know that some of you have really been struggling with some of what I've been teaching. Um, we'll kind of get to a little bit of that today. And, and I, all I really want to say in ending is what I said at the beginning, join the club. Um, <laughs> I've struggled with various elements of Reformed theology as defined by the five solas for the better part of 35 years. And there are still parts that even if I've come to accept as the best way to understand what we read in Scripture about the nature of God and our salvation, uh, there are things I still have a hard time getting my arms around and completely feeling positive about. So if you struggle with some of this, you know, we're in this together. Which kind of leads to my final pre-sermon comment is that there are things I believe the Bible teaches that at a gut level, I don't humanly agree with. But I believe I need to teach and preach and embrace them because I do believe in sola scriptura, the authority of scripture alone for faith, belief, and understanding about God. That's where the line gets drawn. I've, I've told you before, maybe you've been around here for a while, you know that I don't particularly personally like the idea of hell. Uh, people being sent to a place of eternal punishment for their unforgiven sins against God. It does seem kind of beneath the very character of God to me, and something like simply annihilating the unforgiven sinner's eternal soul seems like a better option. But guess what? Eternal judgment and separation from God are a well-grounded biblical truth, coming actually mostly out of the words of Jesus. And for me to assume that I have a better idea then the God who is eternal, perfect, holy, loving, and all-knowing is quite frankly the height of my own self-important arrogance. So also, some of the logical conclusions of our five solas, particularly when it comes to hard things like predestination, are still hard for me to swallow. But again, I'm not in charge. And I hope that anything I have said in this series is something that you will test, not by... Um, assuming that if I believe it, it must be right, or, or by asking yourself simply, well, do I like it or do I approve of the idea myself, but by testing it against the Word of God. I mean, after all, that was the heart of what the Reformation was all about. It's why some Reformers were willing to be literally burnt alive in their efforts to get average Christians a Bible they could read for themselves. So if you hear me say it, like it or not, don't just take it for granted. And I do want to thank those of you who submitted questions or talked to me about some of the questions you had. I knew I wouldn't be able to get to any of them. I will tell you that most of them centered on one dreaded word or idea, and that's predestination, or the elect, election chosen, which all carry the same meaning in Scripture. Let me start by showing you a, a, a brief clip of a very much younger R.C. Sproul, He's got hair in this one. Um, introducing the topic in a whole series he's doing. And, and note with what caution 
he introduces the whole notion of predestination. And any time that there's a discussion on religion, sooner or later, and most often it's sooner, the discussion focuses on some element of the doctrine of predestination. It's one of those things that, at, at, that mystifies us, and at the same time it stimulates our minds and, and the bewilderment that we experience in the face of the concept of predestination uh, sometimes will encourage us to dig more deeply into theology. And it's just one of those subjects that generates a lot of interest and discussion and also controversy. And as I look at the history of Christian scholarship, we see that every great Christian teacher, every theologian that the church has ever produced at some point or another has had to address this question of predestination. And though there's wide divergence of interpreting the doctrine of predestination, there's one thing that we can find that every theologian I've ever examined agrees on, and that is that this doctrine must be treated with great caution. It's a dangerous subject because the more we study it, the tendency it has to raise more questions than it answers. And I'm convinced that of all of the doctrines that we struggle with in Christendom, there's none that is more shrouded in misunderstanding and confusion than the doctrine of predestination. So that in itself calls for a certain kind of sober caution as we approach this subject. And I would add to the uh, theologian's warning of caution that I think it's also a doctrine that requires us an extra measure of charity as we struggle with it and that we need to be patient with each other and with those who differ from us in our views of this particular question. Because I said there's a lot at stake here and feelings can run very high when we discuss the matter of predestination and we ought to be careful to manifest the fruit of God's Holy Spirit among ourselves as we try to deal with it. Now, oh, I've said all of that knowing it won't work <laughs> because once we plunge into this doctrine, you know, who knows what's going to happen. Now, R.C. will, will state um, later in the same lecture that this is just one of six on the topics of predestination he's going to give. And that even in those three hours, he's only going to be able to skate over the topic. So imagine what I'm going to be able to do in the next 15 minutes. So I want to focus on two things this morning, kind of in reverse order. Uh, because normally I think scripture always should come first, but, but please bear with me. Um, if we assume that the case that we have made o over the last 12 weeks for the, the five solas is sound... And honestly, you know, I've talked about these ever since I've been here. They've been a part of the Presbyterian stream of Reformed Christian belief for as long as there have been Presbyterians. This is nothing new. But, but if we made the case that salvation comes only from God as a pure gift of grace, that it is manifest in a changed heart and a personal faith given by the Holy Spirit, and that the sole object of this faith is the person of Jesus Christ, who in his sinless life and sacrificial death on the cross bears the punishment for our sins and makes us, us righteous in the sight of God. Now, if you agree with all this, well, then you have to say, yes, it is God alone who saves us and not ourselves. And if it is God alone who saves us, again, purely by grace and not by our own ability, intelligence, actions, or decisions, 100% grace well, then you have to assume that at some point, God made a decision to save us. That, simply put, is all predestination is about. God deciding to save us by his grace alone. And when you talk in a church about predestination, that's all you're talking about. You're not talking about God controlling and doing everything. Now, we come to this 
not because we necessarily think this is the most desirous way that we'd want God to do things, because honestly, I think by our own standards, it's not. You know, we kind of want to be in charge of our own life, so therefore we want to be in charge of our own salvation, don't we? But because this is the clear and repeated teaching in Scripture, and I'll say the Scripture also illuminates at least one more important detail about this. We'll get to that in a minute. And remember our first sola, again, that the sole and authoritative guide for all things related to God and our relationship with God is the Bible, sola scriptura. So at the great risk of boring you to tears, I know you might think I do that every week, um, let me just read to you three representative scriptures that speak specifically about God choosing us and our dreaded P word in two of them. Um, I know I've read these before in this series. Um, one is Jesus' words from John. Two are from Paul. They are far away, not the only scriptures that deal with this. In fact, let me tell you, friends, read through the New Testament. You will find election and God's choice in every divinely inspired New Testament author. Not just Paul or, or Luke or John. So our first scripture this morning is John chapter 15, beginning at verse 15. Jesus said, I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. I have called you, instead I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. And then verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And then from Romans, where we've spent so much time, Paul writes in chapter 8, beginning at verse 28, For we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that they might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. And then finally this morning, from the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in the sight. In love he be predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Christ Jesus in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has given us in the one he loves in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding and he made known to us the mystery of his purpose and his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ to be put in effect when the times had reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and earth under one head, even Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So friends, let's be honest, like it or not, understand it fully or not, predestination is completely biblical truth. And, and we also learned that the choice of God came not here and now, not in response to some decision we've made, but before creation was even spoken to into existence by God. So if you have a biblical view of salvation and the works of God, predestination needs to be a part of it. And frankly, it was scriptures like these that eventually carried me kicking and screaming into Calvinism. Now, here I know is where you are expecting me all to explain to you all the intricacies of predestination and the sovereignty of God, and then to answer all of your questions like, why did God make people he didn't plan to save? What happens to babies who die in Africa? You know, doesn't this make God unfair? How can the Bible say God wants all people to be saved, but then not have God simply elect everyone? Well, if I had hours to preach, and I expect that most of you will be glad that I don't think I do, um, we could talk about some of these questions and more, and I'd have some modest answers for some of them. In fact, I may do an evening series in the fall to unpack more of this for, for anyone who's interested. 
But you know, I, I couldn't answer all your questions, even to my own satisfaction, because there are many things that God does not give us all the answers to that we want. You know, people associate John Calvin with predestination. He actually wrote very little about it uh, compared to other reformers, but he said must have been, much of it is simply a mystery. He wrote this in his Institutes. He said, when they inquire into predestination, let them remember that they are penetrating into the recesses of the divine wisdom, where he who rushes forward securely and confidently, instead of satisfying his curiosity, will enter in inextricable labyrinth. For it is not right that man should with impunity pry into things which the Lord is pleased to conceal within himself, and to scam that sublime eternal wisdom, which is his pleasure, and I love this line, that we should not apprehend but adore. That therein also his perfections may appear. Those secrets of his will which he has seen to meet it to manifest, are revealed in his word. Revealed insofar as he knew to be conductive to our interest and our welfare. God gives us everything we need to know about him, to trust in him and believe in him and follow him, but doesn't necessarily answer every question we'd ever want. And sometimes when we speculate, we get off track. Now let's be clear. I don't believe that when you die and stand before God, he will ask you your views on predestination and God's sovereignty. I imagine some of those answers will be very apparent at that moment. But he will look on you and see only the righteousness of Christ and welcome you into his kingdom, no matter how you viewed some of the specifics of these deep issues here on earth. That said, if you somehow still think you have in any way saved yourself, that you have added anything to your salvation that was not given to you by grace, by what Jesus Christ did on the cross. That is, as often has been said, that you think you brought anything to the work of Christ but your own sins. That's a problem. And you need to go back to God's word and see how totally and completely fallen we are and how wonderfully and fully, without anything of merit on our part, God has given his grace to us. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourself. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. That's the bottom line. Now let me finish up this morning with two final thoughts, both of which revolve around the way I believe our view of predestination and the sovereignty of God should, more than anything else actually, be a comfort to us. First is this, that the idea of your salvation is God's choice, and God's action ought to be a great comfort to you, because then you never have to worry if you're good enough to merit your salvation, or you can live faithfully enough to deserve to be with God forever. Friends, you know what? You're not and you can't. Let me just say that again. You know, you never have to worry if you're good enough to merit your salvation or can live faithfully enough to deserve to be with God forever because you are not and you can't. What you have in Christ is God's pure gift and one that you cannot lose. Philippians 1, 6, Paul said, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Isn't that a great comfort? And the second thing is this, that predestination teaches us what I think is perhaps the most amazing fact of all. And, and perhaps the one thing that honestly ought to affect your life more than anything else. I know that's a big statement, but I mean it. Because what it says is this, it says, before the Big Bang, before stars begin to burn and galaxies begin to swirl, literally before linear time came into existence, God specifically decided to love you as an individual. And God decided he wanted you to be with him for all eternity. Not some general plan. God, before the creation of all things, chose you. 
And if that does not overwhelm you, then you haven't begun to grasp even the smallest part of that truth. That's what God wants us to know. That's what predestination is all about. That's why Paul can say, Paul is a servant of God, the apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect in their knowledge of the truth, which accords with goodness in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. Because that eternal love of God for you was established even before anything we know ever existed. Tell me that's not amazing. Tell me that's not a comfort. God knew you. God loved you. God called you individually to be his own before the ages began. And frankly, friends, our only response to this is a final sola. And when we say it together, soli deo gloria, glory to God alone for all the wonders of his love that have transcended all time for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this great and wonderful mystery that we probably can't ever get our arms around, get our minds around. But what a wonderful truth that before everything, before time even began, you wandered down the hallways of eternity and brought our face to your mind and chose us to love, to be forgiven by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, to be a part of the body of Jesus Christ and to join you in the fullness of the kingdom of God as a glorified person for all eternity. And what wonder, wonderful truth that is so, Father, even if we can't understand all the parts of it, let us glory, let us wonder, let us find comfort in that which we can understand. The magnanimity of your love, which reaches through time to call us to your side. For we pray these things in the one, in the one who never lies, whose promises are sure, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. What a way, great way we, we remember the promise. You know, there's every, every point of history has a turning point, doesn't it? You know, the D-Day is the turning point of World War II. Battles here and there. Uh, civil rights legislation, there's a turning point. In really all of human history, in all of our relationship with God, there is a turning point, isn't there? And that's the cross. It's what we'll celebrate in a little less than two weeks as we think about Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And, and where we celebrate and remember and focus that is here. Because we, we, we remember two great things here. One is that Jesus Christ gave his body for us. His body was broken. His blood was shed. And, and yet, not only the, the, did he give his life there, but God gave him glory by raising him from the dead so that he is our living Lord now. And, you know, in a, in a Protestant church, this table is right in the middle. You know why? Because this is what we want to focus on, because it reminds us of our presence with God here and now, and our presence with God for all eternity. You know, what does Jesus say about the kingdom of God? You know, many will come from north and south, east and west, and what? Sit at table in the kingdom of God. The, the biblical description of heaven is not clouds and harps and angels. It's a big banquet. And this is just the foretaste of that all. For in a night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus gathers disciples around such a table that remembered the mighty wonder of God's saving grace and, and gave it an even greater meaning. The night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after supper, he poured out the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant poured out in my blood, poured out for the remission of sins. Do this also remembering me. And Paul reminds us that every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. So let us pray. Father, thank you 
that you have brought us to this table, not because we're good, not because we belong here, not because of anything we've done, but because, like in the great parable, you sent your servants out into the alleys and the byways and brought us in, compelled us to come when we were unworthy. So thank you. Thank you for your sacrifice on the cross. Thank you for these simple elements that remind us so wonderfully of what you did for us. And set them aside and bless them that we might be nourished in our souls by them. Bring us to this table only by your grace, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I have those assisting with communion. Please come forward. And again, I would tell you all that this is not the table of Ellensburg Presbyterian Church, but the table of Jesus Christ. And any who have, in their own life, come to the point where Jesus Christ is their Lord and their Savior, are invited, even compelled, to come to the table that, that he has provided for us. In a minute, I'll have you all come forward by the center aisle. Step forward, take a piece of bread, rip it off, dip it in the cup, take it while you're here, and return to the side aisles to your seats. If you don't wish to come forward for any reason whatsoever, we'll be sending some ushers down the side aisle with trays. <laughs>